Hello and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. If you are a first time viewer, please stick around for the intro. It is worth the time. If you are a regular viewer, feel free to skip ahead using the annotation. So first, a few things. I do these videos because I love to learn and help others learn. We are all good at something, so I encourage you to give back to the world in a similar way. Share your passion any way you can. Now, this video focuses on basic stats and is not a quick fix. It aims to be thorough. My goal is an understanding of fundamental concepts and that takes time. But when you understand the fundamentals, learning other topics is much easier. Now, related to that, if you are watching because you are struggling in a class or at work, I want you to stay positive and keep your head up. You can learn this. I have faith in you. Many other people around you have faith in you, and so should you. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, Google+, Twitter, and of course, subscribe here on YouTube. Now, if you think there is something I can do better, please leave a constructive comment below. I do take those comments into account when I make new videos. I also encourage you to talk with other viewers in the comments. Help each other out when you can. And finally, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with classmates or colleagues and put it on a playlist to review later. That does encourage me to keep making them for you. So, all that being said, let's go ahead and start learning. So here we are in the fourth video in our series on multiple regression. Now, as I'm sure you know, there are many different data types. We're most familiar with interval data, like the temperature outside or the value of money or the mass of something on a scale. But there are other types like categorical variables. So male, female, yes, no, true, false, north, south, east, west, London, Liverpool, Blackpool, Newcastle. You get the idea. But luckily, regression is a very flexible statistical technique and we can implement or use categorical variables in our analysis. So this first video is all about that, using a technique called dummy variables to represent categorical information. So as usual, let's go ahead and start out with an actual problem. Now I will say that most of the data in this problem is actually real. I went out and got it on the internet. Now I did change some of the numbers for pedagogical reasons, but other than that, this is actually real data. So here is our scenario. You are an analyst for a small company that develops house pricing models for independent realtors. To generate your models, you use publicly available data, such as list price, the square footage of the home, the number of bedrooms the home has, the number of bathrooms, etc. But you're thinking sort of outside of the box here. You are interested in another question. Is the public high school in the neighborhood exemplary? That's the highest rating. And how is that rating related to the home price? So the high school rating is not quantitative. It is qualitative, it's categorical. So for each home price, the high school is either exemplary or not, yes or no. And those are gonna be the two categories for one of our variables. So here is our home price data. So on the top we have price in thousands, that's our dependent variable. Then we have square feet, that's our first independent variable. And then we have exempt high school. That's our second independent variable. So as we can see, the first home has a price of $145,000 US dollars. The square footage is 1,872 square feet. And that home is in a school district where the high school is not exemplary. So if we go down to the third one, that home is $315,000. It is 4,104 square feet, and it is in a school district where the public high school is exemplary. So you can see how this data works. We have price, that's our dependent, then we have our two independent variables, square footage, and whether or not it's in a school district where the high school is exemplary. So what I went ahead and did is coded the exemplary high school column. So everything is the same, but in the last column, you'll see that if the high school is not exemplary, then I coded that as zero. If the high school is exemplary, I coded that as a one. 
This is sort of the first lesson in dummy variables. So we have two categories here. I assigned one zero and the other one a one. That's completely arbitrary. I could have switched them. I could have made not exemplary one and exemplary zero. It does not matter which one it goes in. But for me, it sort of made more sense that exemplary would be denoted with a one. So here, y is the home price in thousands, x1 is the square footage of the home, and x2 is one if the high school is exemplary and zero otherwise. That's also a common way to write these. So one if it's exemplary, zero otherwise. Because oftentimes, and I'll show you here in a minute, there are more than two categories, so it's best just to put zero otherwise. So here is a grouped scatter plot of our data. You can see a definite pattern here. So the blue dots represent homes where the high school is not exemplary, and the red squares represent homes where the high school is exemplary. So on the bottom of our graph, we have square footage, and on the left hand, the y-axis, we have the price in thousands. So most of our homes down here in the lower left are homes that are smaller, they are homes where the high school is not exemplary and the price is less. Now the red squares show us that those schools are in districts where the high school is exemplary, they're larger homes, and therefore they are higher priced. So we can see a definite pattern here. So you can look at it two ways. We can look at the two groups individually, but if you sort of squint your eyes and look at the data points as a group, we can see that there seems to be a definite pattern here. So we have two patterns going on. The data points as a whole start in the lower left and go up to the upper right. And then we have sort of a separation in the middle where the non-exemplary schools are in the lower left and the exemplary schools are in the upper right. So there's kind of an imaginary line that runs through the graph here separating the blue dots from the red ones. So what are dummy variables exactly? Now in many situations, we must work with categorical independent variables. So in regression analysis, we call these dummy variables, or sometimes they're called indicator variables. They mean the same thing. For a variable with a certain number in categories, there are always going to be n minus one dummy variables. And we'll walk through that here in a minute. So for example, in this case, we have exemplary high schools and not exemplary high schools. Therefore, there are two categories. So two minus one equals one dummy variable. And we saw that in our original data. We had one dummy variable that represented the exemplary schools and the non-exemplary schools with ones and zeros. Now, not related to this problem necessarily, at least yet, let's say we have four categories, north, south, east, and west. So there, there are four categories. So four minus one would equal three dummy variables. And we'll look at that here in a second. Now, even though it's not related to this problem necessarily, let's go ahead and look at the north, south, east, and west example we talked about in the previous slide. So let's say we have north, south, east, and west, and maybe we're looking at housing data or sales data across these four regions. Now, how could we code these as a dummy variables? So we have four categories. We're going to need four minus one dummy variables. So we could code it like this. So we have X1, X2, and X3 along the top. Those are our three dummy variables. Now we could represent north where X1 is one and X2 and X3 are zero. The south region would be zero for X1, one for X2, and zero for X3. East would be 0, 0, 1. And here's what confuses some people. The West, the fourth region, would be zeros all across. So West would be coded nothing. So North would be 1 for X1, South would be 1 for X2, East would be 1 for X3. And for the West region, we would not put any ones in a regression. And we'll see how that works as we go forward. So this is an example of a variable with four categories and three dummy variables. So it's back to our problem at hand. So this is very similar to some of the other multiple regression we did in previous uh, videos. So 
we have the expected value of y, the dependent variable, equals beta zero, that's our intercept, plus beta one x one, that's our first coefficient, and our first independent variable, plus beta two and x two, that's our second coefficient, and our second variable. Now, we have two things going on here. We have one case where the x2 is zero, where the high school is not exemplary. And then we have another case where the high school is exemplary and x2 is a one. So let's look at the first case first. So the expected value of home price given the high school is not exemplary, that's where x2 equals zero. So we're gonna go ahead and change this estimated regression equation up there at the top to reflect that. So E, the expected value of Y, our dependent variable, given, that's the straight line, given that the high school is not exemplary. So we rewrite that equation as beta zero plus beta one X one plus beta two times zero. Because remember, when X two is zero, that means our high school is not exemplary. So we can go ahead and put that in for X two. Now we'll just do some simple algebra. Well, beta sub two times zero is zero. So it basically disappears. And we're left with beta sub zero plus beta one X one. Now, what about when the high school is exemplary and X two equals one? Same process. So beta sub zero plus beta one x one plus beta two, but this time times one. Because remember, that's the value when the high school is exemplary. So again, some simple algebra, beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two, because beta two times one is itself, beta two. Now, those are gonna be two constant numbers, beta sub zero and beta two, are just gonna be numbers without any variables attached. So we can actually combine them. So in parentheses, we have beta sub zero plus beta two plus beta one x one. So we actually have two different regression equations here. In the first case, x two is zero. In the second case, x two is one. So we always have to realize that there is a regression equation for every possible scenario in the dummy variable. In this case, it's two. We have zero and one as far as the values of that dummy variable. So when we conduct the regression in Minitab, this is what we get. We can see our categorical predictor coding of one and zero. Then we have our ANOVA table as usual. So we look across the regression line there we can see that our F value is 35.94 with a P value of 0 0.000. That of course means it's less than 0 0.001 and is significant. Now we look down here at the bottom, our model summary. We have an R squared of 85.7, an R squared adjusted of 83.31, and an R squared predicted of 70.3. So a high R squared and high R squared adjusted along with an R squared predicted that doesn't fall off a cliff. Remember in part three, I mentioned that even if we have a high R squared and a high R squared adjusted, and then our R squared predicted just goes crazy low, like off a cliff, say, you know, 50%, then we would be concerned. Our regression equation is not doing a good job at predicting. So everything here looks good. Let's go ahead and look at our coefficients. So we have the constant term, we don't worry about that in this case. Then we have the square foot variable. That has a p-value of 0 0.010, so that is significant at 0 0.05. And then we have exempt high school, where the value is one, and that is significant at 0 0.018. So square foot coefficient is significant, and the exempt high school coefficient is significant. Now, what about the values of the coefficients? For square foot, it's 0 0.0621. Now remember, that's in thousands of dollars. Now for exempt high school, it's 98.6, and we'll talk about that here in a second. So first, let's talk about square foot and its coefficient. So every square foot is related to an increase in price in the home of 0 0.0621,000, or when you multiply that out, 
$62.10 per square foot. So think about this for a minute. That's one square foot. What if the house is 10 square feet larger? Well, that would be $621. What about 100 square foot larger? Well, that would be $6,210. But what about a 1,000 square foot larger home? Well, that would be $62,100 in price. So you can see how each additional square foot is related to the price of the home in this regression model. So now let's interpret exempt high school. Remember, its coefficient is 98.6. So what does that mean? Well, it means that on average, a home in an area with an exemplary high school is related to a $98,600 higher price. So if we have two homes, the same square footage, let's say both homes are 1,500 square feet, one is in a district where the high school is not exemplary. One is in a district where the high school is exemplary. Same square foot. The only difference is the high school rating. The home in the district with the higher rated high school will be $98,600 higher in price. So let's go ahead and do the full interpretation with the numbers we just generated along with our regression equation. So the equation we got from Minitab is 27.1 plus 0.0621x1, we talked about that last slide, plus 98.6x2. So the only thing we didn't talk about really in the last slide was the intercept, but that's not really relevant for this type of model, but we'd still need it, of course. So let's go ahead and just plug everything in. So the expected value of a home price given the high school is not exemplary, where x2 equals zero, so all we do is take the zero and substitute that in for x2. So we go ahead and do that. So 98.6 times zero is zero. So we're left with 27.1 plus 0.0621x1. So it's a very simple algebraic linear equation. Now what about when the high school is exemplary? So there, x2 equals one. So we go ahead and substitute everything back in there. So 98.6 times one is 98.6. Now we can combine the 98.6 with the 27.1. So we put that in parentheses, and that is 125.7 plus the 0.0621x1. So here are our two lines. Here are our two linear equations. And we'll actually look at that on a graph here next. So here are the two regression equations that Minitab gives us. It's saying that when the high school is not exemplary, that's zero, the price in thousands is equal to 27.1 plus 0 0.0621 square feet. We just figured that out on the last slide. When the high school is exemplary, that's one, the price in thousands is 125 plus 0 0.0621 square foot. So you notice there that the slope of these lines are the same, 0.0621. The only thing that's different are the intercepts. So let's go ahead and put those actually on a graph. And here it is. So we can see that the first example where the high school is exemplary, where it's one, that's the 125.7 plus 0.0621 square foot. That is sort of the blue purple line here on the top when we actually graph that on a graph. Then of course the red line is the homes without an exemplary high school. So you can see that these two lines are just algebra one. We can go ahead and put those on a graph. Now it actually has meaning though. There's a distance between them. And guess what that is? 98.6. So the average distance between these two lines is the $98,600 that we talked about a couple of slides ago. So everywhere along this distance, the average distance or the average price difference is 98.6 or $98,600. Now just for the sake of learning, I went ahead and conducted another scatter plot, but actually put each group's regression line inside of it. Now, as you can see, this looks somewhat similar to the graph we had in the previous slide. But remember, the previous slide is the average over everything. Here, each line is unique to each group. So the general pattern is the same. 
and actually the red line is actually pretty close to the exact same. But because the way the homes are distributed on here, it's not going to be exactly the same as we saw in the, in the last slide. Because it's, again, regression is all about the averages over everything. But here you can definitely see the difference between the homes that have an exemplary high school in its district and those that don't. Okay, so that wraps up our introduction to dummy variables. Now we'll be doing more with dummy variables in the next video, but I just wanted to get your feet wet so you understand what they are, where they come from, how we use them to code different categories of data, and then we, how we use those variables that we code in actual regression. Now, of course, they do get more complex, but the basic interpretation is the same. So hopefully you were able to develop a good fundamental understanding of dummy variables so you can apply that to more complex problems. So thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe if you have not done so already, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next video.